Um, all right, so, I mean, <laughs> most of the people in the audience actually know you guys already, but for those who don't, let's just do origin stories. Um, be as detailed as you want. I know that um, it helps a sense of connection. People want to know who they're hearing from. So maybe Al Alex, you can roll in first. Just tell us about your background. Yeah, 100%. Um, so for a context for anyone in the audience, I'm Alex. I'm the co-founder of Bricktopians, or some of you guys might know us now as Abnormal Studios as we weave into bringing uh, 3D printed sneakers into the digital and physical world. So my background, um, the quick TLDR is, um, I've been in the blockchain space for about seven years now. A lot of ups and downs in that period. I was lucky enough to invest in ETH at $45. I consulted um, last year to the NBA, to Mecca, to Cricket Australia on NFTs. And then, of course, I've launched my own uh, NFT collection, Bricktopians, which we're building on every single day. So. If you, if you haven't heard of a Bricktopian before, I highly recommend you check it out. The background on that is essentially, we just basically asked ourselves, what is the most possible computing power that we could throw at an NFT collection? And what would that look like? And what that looks like is every single NFT essentially being animated to move in its own unique way so that you have a one of one that um, you'll never see anywhere else. And so we've done the impossible in the digital world. Now we're going into the physical with what we're creating in the brain boot. That's dope. Did you just say you consulted Mechaverse? No, 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 no. <laughs> I thought, I thought Do you know what's funny? The first thing I said um, to Mecca, Mecca Cosmetica for anyone, uh, I, I know the That's an important your, clarification yeah, for people that, in this room. <laughs> but do you know what's so funny is that the first thing that I actually had to tell them was they were like, we've got this great name patented. You guys are going to love it. It's called the Mechaverse. And this was one week after Mecca, for anyone who, who was an OG back then, an OG uh, a year ago. Um, everyone knows that Mechaverse rugged and we're like, ah, that is not what you're going to market with. So yeah, no, so, good clarification. <laughs> good Mecha Cosmetica, they're, they're looking at some cool stuff in the space. Awesome. Tak? Yeah, so for, for those that do not know, uh, I'm Takoa, right? But, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks fam. Um, so previously, before I got into Web3, I was uh, in Web2, I have been exposed to a couple of industries. So I've been in a tech startup, I've been in a VC uh, firm as well. So we dealt with like cross-border China and Southeast Asia tech investments. Um, but my last post was in renewables, in the renewables industry in Melbourne, an uh, advisory house. Um, but you know, I saw Web3 as an opportunity and I saw the potential for that. And I started to use my finance background and I started to call projects for fun. So alpha calling for fun on Twitter, space, on like Twitter, and that just blew up last year, like from 1K followers, which was something that was unplanned to like 200 plus K in like three months, which was absurd. And uh, I could just kind of roll with that because I saw the whole, in, it was insane. The growth was exponential. Um, but from then, I took my lessons and I, I started to pivot more towards project building. So I founded my own project called Forgotten Ethereal Worlds. For those that do not know, it's like a 350 uh, 3D landscape art piece and that uh, evolves as time goes on. Uh, so the whole out point of that was like networking, alpha calls, and we've like delivered over 10 million USD, uh, 10 million USD worth of white spots and alpha calls in the past 10 months. This is value back to our community, which is what I, you know, it's been always the focus. And uh, so now we've just been, I, I've just been working on launchpad side of things. So we've been helping projects launch um, if they need help with marketing, design, smart contracts, etc., uh, we just help in to fill in the gaps. But yeah, that's basically my story. So, yeah. so for both of you, um, first-time founders in Web3, first-time founders in general? Um, I, I got to be lucky enough to be brought in as an intern into a previous company. So I'm actually a minority shareholder in another company as well, which has meant that I've got to experience what it takes to grow a business. And I've brought a lot of that knowledge into now building my own collection with Bricktopians. Cool. And, and so for me, before I got into NFTs, I had co-founded a Axie Infinity Scholarship Guild called Lambda Clan, and this was one of the Malaysia's, so I'm from Malaysia, Malaysia's fastest growing scholarship program at a point in time. And yeah, but you know, with the whole Axie economy not doing well, um, we just had to cut it down. But uh, that, that's, well, that's great, because that's something we're obviously going to talk about, not that specifically, but just the idea of, um, of startups having to shut down and this correct. sort of misconception that people have that if a startup 
fails, it's the founder's fault, and there's uh, there's nothing, there's no re redeeming quality about that. A lot of the other sessions that have covered um, the founder's stories uh, in 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 this event have kind of focused on like a tactical nuance, and I think we're yeah. going to dig a bit deeper into like the mental health side of things. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, um, that was not a question, but roll with it. <laughs> to, to add on that, though, to anyone that is thinking of starting an NFT collection, I think obviously, unless you do a Zagabon and launch like five of them and then and then hit. Um, oh, sorry, that that was a oh, shot, Elsa. shot calling. Um, this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's all right. Um, but you really do need to understand the level of commitment that you're getting into when you launch an NFT project. I was actually just yeah. speaking to my friend David outside, and we were talking about. There's, there's two sides of the coin. There's a, um, an NFT business, like a consulting firm or something like, uh, of that sort of sort, where, which can be a lot harder to get customers and, and grind in that way, but you're much more accountable to yourself and your team. Whereas when you launch a project, you're in it. You are full-time. You are the project. The project is you, and you have to live and breathe it. And it is an insane commitment that is a lot of fun if you, if you dive right into it. So, so what, maybe it's, you can take this on, what don't people understand about the mental burden of being a founder, whether it be Web3 or, or Web2, just that, that general sort of burden and the, the mental toughness required to, to push through that? That's a great question, Jameson. So I, I think a lot of people underestimate the whole mental you know, toughness that you have to have. Thick skin. As a founder, you really need to have a lot of thick skin to take in all the FUD that comes at you. Whether or not it's your fault or, or external factors that you know, affect the project, you have the face of it, you have to deal with it. Um, but that's it, you know. It's, I think mental health as a subject in Web3 is not really talked about enough. Uh, we've started. We started to see a bit of that change, you know, with uh, um, you know mental health being a focus. But overall, is is not been really highlighted because you know, even in, in even in normal sense right now, like maybe in like Asian countries where I'm from, therapy, you know, counseling is not, or seeing a psychiatrist for help, mental health is not uh, looked upon as, as as something good. You know, it looks like you have a problem, right? But uh, you know, we have to start normalizing that as a founder, we go through a lot of these hurdles. And there's something, if, if sometimes as a founder, I think a lot of us here can empathize is that it sometimes feel like it's a very lonely journey and you have no one else to talk to. So maybe, Alex, you have, you can feel the same way? Or? Yeah, well, it's actually been nice for us to even be able to share stories yeah. outside. Finding someone else that's gone through similar things is definitely super helpful. Um, but something that I say to a lot of founders before they start is, Starting an NFT collection is very much like living in the YouTube comment section. And if you can handle that, you'll do fine. But you need to appreciate that there's going to be this fire stream of consciousness. We often talk about it almost as though I got Posty with his hand up oh, and Posty gives me a lot of fun and a lot of shit. Um, no, nah, good to see you, man. Um, but um, the mental side is really challenging. I think what's so challenging is that uh, I saw a great tweet from um, Frank and he said, it's awesome how many experts there are who have clearly been through um, launching an NFT collection and running it through a global recession. It's like, I'm really excited to learn from you guys. It's like, no, we're all on this journey together. We're all, um, even just you guys being here in the space shows how pioneering everyone here is um, in their mindset. But I think we all appreciate that. It's like, if you're going to be um, the first pioneers, you are going to go into choppy waters. You're going yeah. to, there's going to be a tidal wave. And then sometimes there'll be a beautiful opportunity that you get to dive into. And I see it as an adventure. And if you look at it from the perspective of an adventure, it becomes a lot more rewarding. One practical tip I've found really helpful is um, I started to learn about um, stoicism, which uh, it might sound super esoteric, but it's essentially the, the mindset of if you just welcome challenges and you look at challenges as an opportunity for growth, then and you wake up with that mindset every time and you repeatedly implement that mindset, suddenly you start to almost like surf the wave rather than be crushed by it. And I, I've now grown to, even in the hardest times, even when the FTX drama happens and we're in the middle of building our um, next uh, piece that we're releasing, you have to wake up and you have to go, okay, this is a new challenge today. How do I navigate this? And, and right. yeah, it definitely takes a bit of a stomach. The obstacle is the way. The, obst the obstacle is the way, exactly. I saw your eyes light up when I said that. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like a tech bro meme, isn't it? It's stoicism, but it's super valuable. Yeah. Jack, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of uh, the times that you know, we see a founder, right? Um, and if, if 
if they fail or if they are struggling with their project, most often the times we just tend to like, you know, join the bandwagon and like try to take them down and say, yeah, you don't deserve to be here. Get out of here as a founder <laughs> uh, and all of that. But what's, what's an entrepreneur? I think all of us here in the space are technically entrepreneurs or pioneers, right? We want to build things. We want to push things forward. We want to push things to the limit. But at the same time, you know, like you said, choppy waters, you, everything's an adventure. Sometimes you go through the good times, sometimes you go through the bad times, but when the bad times happen, you know, shit hits rock bottom. We just saw FTX collapse and all of that. And, you know, a lot of projects are starting to run out of their funds that they, you know, that they, uh, you know, get it last year. And, and so does that mean once you fail once, you can never get back up again? I don't think so, because I think, you know, First of all, I believe in second chances. I also believe that if you are an entrepreneur and you're true to your spirit, a fighting spirit, uh, it's how you get back up and continue to persevere. That matters more than anything. Yeah. Um, can I just uh, build on that? Do you want to go to the next question? Like I said, this is like a Twitter Call, space. Twitter you space? Just, no, you just roll. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, is it, uh, I don't know what uh, type of room we have here, but are there any Kobe fans in this room? Because I am a massive Kobe fan. Okay, good, a few hands. Um, something that I'm really inspired by is the fact that we all see this, right, on, on Twitter, that every single day another, another project, another founder leaves the space and there are less and less launching or less and less that are able to reach a certain height. So to me that says, okay, cool, if we're the last one standing, uh, this attention is going to consolidate. And then if we're, we're the last one standing, the way that we look at um, CryptoPunks from years ago, even CryptoKitties, obviously they, their supply dynamics are a bit different in terms of long-term value. But I look at it like if we can show up every single day, people say, who are the builders in this space? Who is building? Well, my name is Alex is building. So that, that's where it starts. But, um, but it's not just obviously in a name. It's posting a Twitter thread every single day, being on Twitter spaces every single day, making sure people who are starting to feel not confident in the market go, look, I don't know anything anymore, everything is falling apart, but I do know I see this person in spaces every single day. I see this person showing up every single day, and I see this person's face. And so that's something I've started to do more as well as posting videos. So I kind of like, I heard this story, the reason I, to go back to Kobe is like, I heard this story of, um, when Kobe and the USA team, they stayed in like the hotels in Vegas. Um, the rest of the team like went out at night and they would like go and party and um, be like, come on Kobe, have fun, blah, blah, blah. And then they'd get back at four in the morning and they'd see Kobe in the living room with ice on his knees because he'd just done a workout and was about to do another one and then another one before they even got their first workout in. And I, I, that drives me every single day. I'm like, how can we make sure that people know this is what we're doing and then that makes all the pain tolerable because it's like, good, everyone is feeling pain. Let's feel it even more and break through it. That's awesome. Can we, um, can we recenter around this, this idea of failure and, and how acceptable it is or is not in the Web3 space? And one thing that came up for me when you were talking about that, Zach, was obviously in the Web2 space and the broader ecosystem, a lot of the times um, uh, founders need to raise capital. They raise capital from angels and VCs, right? Yes. And in that instance, there's an expectation of a certain rate of failure. And the VCs sort of budget that in, obviously, when they're raising their funds. And in most in instances, if a startup fails, as long as the founder sort of behaves um, with, with a high ethic, then they, they get the second chance and the third chance. And, and indeed, there's some yes. data to suggest that second time founders are, are, are way more successful on average. But the question I have, or I guess the, the comment that we can dive into is, in in Web3, there's, or specifically NFTs, there's sort of weird murky nuance where the community are the investors or they think of themselves as investors, but of course they're not investors in the same sense. They don't yeah. have equity. And do you think perhaps that's where some of the quote unquote FUD or anxiety comes? That's a great question. Because, um, so coming from a VC background, I think, um, yes, to answer your point, like there, there is a lot of uh, founders that have failed once before, but through the ethics, their principles, their morals, and their connections, they can continue and, and start again. You know, there's, there's no issue with that. But in for, in, and, and of course, one thing I want to point out is that VCs, what they get exchanged for in terms of equity is, um, you know, higher level of investment, right? You put in more towards the project, you get a piece of ownership, right? That's what you get. But as NFT investors, people that buy the NFT or mint the NFT, you are not, you are not a shareholder, 
you do not have the entitlement or say to move the company in a certain direction. But sure, collectively as a voice, this is where the social uh, influence of NFTs come in, where social equity of uh, NFTs being the floor price and all of that, and, and, and PFPs being free marketing for the project. Um, NFT investors has a role to play in terms of the whole brand in the, in the, in the project and how you market that elsewhere. Uh, but in terms of driving specific decisions in, a comp uh, in the project, uh, less so. Yeah, I think there's a bit of nuance to it. It's it's quite interesting because it almost creates a a freedom in which um, a project can create um, utility that might be a little bit more unique, to, even compared to like a crowdfunding exercise. What I really love about, um, and I think it's dangerous to use the word investors, obviously, um, SEC reasons you, you can never use that word, but what the difference between what a... Um, an NFT, let's say, sale brings to the lifespan of a project is something ex that we almost don't see in any other brands in the entire world, and that is amplification that continues while, like, while I sleep, there are still people growing Bricktopians. As long as there's this mutualism where we both feed this machine, we can actually drive it so much larger than maybe, let's say, let's say we were just a sneaker brand and we did crowdfunding for our sneakers. A lot of people um, who invest in like crowdfunding, for example, they often become quite passive, they'll check in, they might see um, how something went six months later. But there is a unique dynamic that we get in NFTs, which is, there's almost like a kindling that helps amplify something into success. So I, don't, I think it would be much harder for us to spread the word about the Brain Boot if we didn't have um, Bricktopian holders who are vested in the interest of that being a success. And so um, everyone works together a lot more aggressively to get that outcome, which I think is quite unique to our space. Makes sense. Uh, I want to talk about FUD. Yeah. Um, there was a... <laughs> King FUD. There was a, a fantastic session earlier um, with uh, Sean, Asher, and I think maybe they're even here, and George, uh, hosted by Z. And something Sean said really stood out to me about the, um, the eliciting feedback within the Discord, which is obviously, a, a, like, it's a bold move. Um, and I think it's something that engenders a lot of um, trust and respect from the community. Um, Obviously, this question is not for Sean, but I, I want to ask you guys, like, yep. when, you, when you get hit with that FUD as founders, as I'm sure you have been at times, how do you process it? How do you sort of, like, push back against it in such a way that doesn't alienate your community? That's a good question, because uh, as someone has got a lot of FUD, <laughs> um, I think there's a... Look, everyone's different. Everyone's um, copes FUD in a different way. Like, I'm more of a reserved kind of person, so I'm not really one to voice out or to try to defend myself on Twitter, even though it's not real or, or, or fake. Um, and I, I process it more of, um, okay, I talk to my family, I talk to my friends, uh, the ones I trust, and like just trying to rationalize all of this. Um, at the same time, um, you know, trying, I think the best way to fight FUD is to over-communicate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can okay. keep going if you want. Yeah, basi uh, ba basically, you know, answer all your questions um, and, and just communicate. And like the word transparency, just be as transparent as you can. Um, of course, like, you know, there are some things which, you, you know, you, you can't just give all your business plans away as well as a project that just, you know, just doesn't work. Um, but, it, you know, give what you can. And, um, and, and if they're like, let's say, a father that just has no room to talk to you in person or, you know, logically ask you questions and stuff, um, then you just ignore them, yeah. Yeah, just to build on what Tako was saying, <clears throat> um, I find for me, the FUD comes from usually when a project, like we saw with Doodles, right? There was like almost like two or three months where they just didn't communicate and everyone was like, well, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? If any of us are connected to this NFT space, it's because we want to stay a part of it. It's almost like our, um, it's like our sport. We're, we're connected to it on a daily basis. And similarly, if you can keep people up to date on progress on a daily basis, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like, 
the hot, throwing the whole kitchen sink, but me being able to show, hey, we've got some like new colorways coming through. Hey, we've just placed another order. Hey, we're making this adjustment. It makes people go like, well, are we launching in three weeks? Are we launching in two weeks? It's like, well, you can do the mental math. If I'm saying, hey, we just made this adjustment. We're ordering a new batch that we're going to get in a week or so. Then people go, oh, I have a, a bit of an understanding of where this is going, what's going on. And if they have a problem with the overall direction of the project, that's something different. That's something that we can have more of a conversation on. But something that I, I try to do a lot is not just say what we're doing it, but what we're doing, but say why we're doing it. So the reason, for example, I talk about making a brain boot is because, as many of us know, it's you can't can't sell PFPs forever. And any project that doesn't find a revenue source will eventually die out. So my conversation is, we're creating a, the, the way I like to think of what we're building is, uh, I'm trying to nudge physicals uh, products and that, that carries us forward as a revenue stream and we keep the digital world as rewards. And by communicating more of that mindset, people are like, okay, I get this. I get why it's important for us to get to a point of viability with this because that's what sustains this long term and creates all the other things that I've been excited that you guys have, been, uh, have discussed about. Awesome. Um, I know we've got a bunch of gigabrains in the room, so I want to give the opportunity for people to ask questions. I'll throw it to the audience after this. Um, but my sort of closing question was, um, you know, obviously we're in a very, very different environment now to when you both were building your, your projects. Um, what sort of advice do you have for anybody who's looking to become a founder during this period? Um, anything at all, anything you think would be particularly helpful and how to sort of like build through a bear market? I think the number one thing you should have is people you trust in your team. Without your team, you do not have a foundation to grow and build whatever idea you have. So focus on the who you have closest to you and make sure that is, is uh, people that you can trust. So I got two pieces of advice. First one is you don't have to start an NFT project to work in NFTs or to work in Web3. And your te if you feel that your temperament is much more suited to starting um, like a B2B consulting business where you can like develop relationships, it'll be a lot more fun, a lot more organic growth. You don't have that. You actually could tell your team, hey, I'm going to take a week off. Um, I'm going to spend it with my wife. Whereas um, it can be a little bit more challenging to do that when you have the responsibility of being a founder. Um, but the second piece of advice I'd have is if you're going to start um, an NFT collection, starting one now is very different to what it was a year ago. And I know this because we launched, I think, actually a year ago to the day, today. Yeah, it, it's actually our birthday. Um, today? Yeah, 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 literally. Congrats. Well, technically it was last night, but yeah, so it's our birthday. Um, but back then, like, we were even... So, Lord Agree and I, my co-founder, we've been developing the Brain Boot. Even before we developed Bricktopians, it was, it was very much born out of um, his digital art and me telling him that you could actually attach a really cool NFT model to this. It was, like, way back when it was, um, it was like, Top Shot and stuff was popping off. Um, and the when we were launching the, the Brain Boot as a part of our roadmap, we felt a lot more comfortable in, let's say, March, April of last year to launch it just as an NFT and back ourselves to come up with the physical in, a, in an appropriate period of time because that's what the market was. It was shooting from the hip. Now it's all about trust. And that's why I have to show shoes on my feet. I have to be a lot more active with sharing where we're at from a development standpoint because no one wants to buy anything if they don't feel like it's going to come on the back end. So you can build trust through building your personal brand, being active, being clear, and being a good communicator. And that will go a long way to launching your co collection. You don't need Soldier Boy to shout you out. <laughs> no, those were the days, man. Yeah. But basically, I think another thing to add is if you are looking to start a NFT project, um, the you know one of the ways you can do is to make sure to have all the stuff ready on hand, not just up to the point of mint, but post mint as well. Because communication post mint, people are gonna start asking for okay, what have you? What where's the value? Because now you know we've seen a lot of projects that launched last year and stuff. And uh, okay, animal PFP. But where's the artwork? Where, yeah, where's the artwork? You know, yeah. like yeah, where's the value? What do they get from an endpoint user from the project? Because they're looking to spend their, their ETH and mint, right? Like uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.5. Um, and then saying, okay, if it's not just for a flip, if I hold on to this NFT, what can I get? Right? So you got to think of more than just up until mint and just getting the funds. But 
what are you going to do and deliver? How are you going to, what is your long term plan for this? What is your exit plan as well? Awesome. All right. I think we've got time for a few questions. I'll be the roving mic and I'm going to get over here so that I can actually see. Does anybody have any questions for either of these gentlemen? That's, yeah, I'm not going to give the mic uh, to no, you. No, no. <laughs> There's just no way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed your session. I already know his no question. Posting. I already know his question. He asked it outside. Middle. Oh, cool. Sorry. Uh, thanks, guys, for the information. Um, this one's to you, Alex. Um, you spoke about the 4 a.m. grind. Hey, can you hear me? You spoke about the 4 a.m. grind and Kobe and. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So you spoke about that, I guess, from a mental health point of view. Isn't that sort of part of the problem? And I, I guess on top of this, you're saying that if you want to go into NF the NFT, you want to be a founder, do you just have to suck it up? Is that what you're saying? Or do you have any comments on that? It, it's funny. It's like um, many of us, uh, I've had a, a lot of mental health challenges myself even b before starting an NFT collection. And there's like two, two ways to deal with um, mental health challenges. And one is like the bad way which is you stuff you stuff it down or there's the good way which is you kind of acknowledge it and you deal with it something that is super important to me in my day-to-day -day life is time with family it's basically the number one thing and so you need to what i've found is you need to be always on but the there's a paradox within that which is you carve out time where you are deliberately consciously present with the people you you care about or what you care about doing and so look i'll be honest if you're starting an nft collection and you you sell it um from for money people are going to expect a lot from you and if you can't handle that you shouldn't do it um but so yeah you you do you do have to suck up a fair bit but that doesn't mean you have to take on read every comment, take it on personally, really like let it get under your skin. Instead, what you can do is almost look at it like a tidal wave, understand the flows, not take it too personally. And the biggest, the biggest practical tip I've, I've found is just meditating and being able to separate yourself from the comments and just move into problem solving mode rather than, oh shit, there's someone yelling at me, I need to quickly fix something. If you can, can keep your emotions in check, you'll do well. But if you can't, I just would say don't do it at all because it's a lot of fun to raise a lot of money up front and then it's not a lot of fun. Uh, and if you're planning to rug, I'm sure that's even more fun for those people. But if you actually plan to stick with it, it is a brutal, brutal thing to get into. And I don't want to sugarcoat it. But at the same time, it is the most fun, rewarding thing I've ever done. I never would have thought we could create like that we could create a bunch of people that love the art that we put out and now share our vision about adaptable wearables um, in the physical world, all enhanced by all of the stuff I love in Web3. And so that's what wakes me up every day and that's worth the pain. If you don't have something like that for you, just don't do it. Zach, did you have something you wanted to say on that? Or? I'm good. Okay, uh, got time for one more. Uh, yeah, hey guys. Uh, what uh, NFT project mechanic do you think is most underrated that you wish more projects did? And what NFT project mechanics do you think are most overrated that you wish projects would stop doing? Okay, so I'm going to say for the overrated one, I think staking is overrated. Same. Facts. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, so last year, you know, we, we, had, we had a lot of projects that launched staking and as well as tokens all right so uh, not to show shade but like yeah it's it's Throw just no 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 it's just not sustainable right yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a lot of fluff yeah. you know um uh, redu reduction or you stake your nft reduction in supply means the floor price will go higher at that point in time like um yeah it's just it's just that's that's just overrated um underrated underrated i'm having a go yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just to add on the overrated, um, I basically have a rule in my mind. You have to ask the question, and then what? And you have to keep asking that till the end of the chain. And if you can't answer those questions, don't launch that utility. So when we were getting pressured to um, launch a coin and start staking, it's like, well, I want you guys to launch a coin, and then what? 
And then you can stake them for more coins. It's like, okay, and then what? And then you could buy stuff with it. What stuff? Uh, I don't know. It's like, exactly. Yeah. Uh, a free NFT. And then it's like, okay, but and then what? Yeah. And it's like, why is anyone going to participate in this system? You just want to see the coins become more scarce marginally and for, for a moment. And then, Everything's and then get a Ponzi. Rid. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Ponzi-nomics. Um, the, yeah, well, that's a yeah, combo that's for another, another day. Yeah. I got posty. But the, the <laughs> underrated one, I'm going to be biased in this, but I, I, I build for it because I believe in it. And I'll use not us as the example. Let's say Nike was going to release the Travis Scott Jordans, which people literally sleep outside of Nike for days to get. If they said they were going to release that as an NFT and rather than us shipping shoes all over the world, storing them in our, in our um, uh, closet at home where no one sees when those people do care about flex culture but they don't wear them, what if they could just own it in their digital wallet, they could flip it by selling it to other people and then when someone finally wants to wear it, they burn the NFT and the supply is clear to everyone. For me, that's something that needs to exist in the world and that's why we're building it. I think not enough projects are going in the physical world because... As, we, as we've learned and we're pushing through, is like, wow, it's a lot easier to sell a PFP and, and move that through the Ethereum network than it is to move physical items around the world. But I'm really excited by the physical... I think Azuki have done some really cool stuff. It's, it's going to be really um, interesting to see how physicals play into the space. I know I, I fought it at the beginning, but you've got to pay respect where respect's due. Wonderful. All right, we're at time. So um, please give a, a warm round of applause to Alex and Tekoa.